Planet Earth, the third rock from the sun, our home. Planet Earth has been around for four and a half billion years, but how long has it been called Earth for, and who gave it its name? Hello, and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions, the channel that looks to answer a plethora of queries from science to space, history to pop culture, and more. I'm your host, Rebecca Felgate, and today I'm asking, how did Earth get its name? Before we jump into answering this question, I want to ask you guys what your favourite planet outside of Earth is. Mine has to be Saturn. I liked it, there are rings on it, good. Also, while you're down there leaving me a comment, why don't you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Life's Biggest Questions if you haven't already. Also, do click on that notification bell so you're the first to hear a big answer. Alright, Earth. Earth is the English language name for our planet. It isn't actually the universal name for our rock. In Spanish it is Terria, in Dutch it is Ard, in Swedish it is Jordan, and Erda in some Germanic languages. The one thing they all tend to have in common is that they all are rough translations that also synonym soil or ground, so the generally accepted universal name roughly translates in most languages. It is the only one of the planets in our solar system that has not been named after a Greek or Roman god or goddess. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, all Greek or German. The earliest name among them were first spotted in around 5 BCE, although I say that, this is when their names were first recorded. A lot of these planets are actually visible to the naked eye and may have had different names and understandings from other ancient civilizations who just didn't write them down. The word Earth itself started appearing in text around the 8th century AD, but Earth is the only planet not named after a Greek or Roman god, which seems to suggest that Actually, it was probably named before we had an awareness of other planets, which means the name must go back until much further than it's been documented. In terms of who named the Earth, we simply can't tell you. It's likely there was not just one individual, but rather a general consensus as to the name. It makes sense really, words like ground, soil, terrain, earth, it's something we have always stood on, something tangible and constant, something even our earliest of human ancestors would have understood. Our understanding that we walk on something hard led us to give it a name, and as that hard ground seemed constant in multiple places and locations, it seems that likely that multiple people adopted the name as to better communicate. The word earth was further perpetuated in the King James Bible of 1611, which reads, God called the dry land Earth. This is in Genesis 1.10. But of course, by the time that baby was written, we were already calling it Earth anyway. So, I mean, if God did name it Earth, he probably should have written that one down and left some evidence so we could credit him. Probably. <clears throat> Moving on. The the interesting point here really is, when it comes to etymology, some words have existed longer than our ability to write them down. Something to consider, like sure, we call it Earth and everyone basically seems cool with that from one translation to another, but do you think animals have a different word for it? We assume that animals don't really get or understand planets, but I wonder if they have their own understanding of the land. Also, I wonder if aliens, if they exist and know about us, have a different name for it too. We go around naming things in our solar system, in our galaxy, but they might not be the names that they would pick for themselves if they could. Imagine, for example, we found life on Jupiter, and all of the Jupiter aliens were like, what's a Jupiter? Our home's called Shinaqui. What are words anyway? That sounds like a philosophical distraction, Rebecca. Not an answer. Honestly, how astute of you, I'm sorry. Ultimately, we don't know exactly who named our planet, so the story as to how we became known as Earth is incomplete. We can only assume a lot of people looked down, decided on a soily, groundy sounding word, and we all called it that because it just made sense. So guys, who do you think first coined the name Earth? What would you call it now if you had a choice? 7.5 billion people live on planet Earth, and that number grows every single day. But planet Earth is not getting any bigger, and won't be able to handle its growing population forever. At a point, the planet will become overpopulated, and resources will be scarce. There is only so much water and food to go around. Today, Life's Biggest Questions asks, how many people can Earth sustain? Overpopulation is arguably one of the biggest threats to Earth. According to Paul Ehrlich, a Stanford University biologist, we 
face resource depletion, species extinction, and a human population so large that as a species we face mass poverty, famine, starvation, and death. Well, that doesn't sound very promising, does it? Ehrlich says the Earth reached its total capacity already in the 1960s and 70s, and since then we've been living on borrowed time. In the 1960s and 70s, scientists were warning about the potential dangers of overpopulation. At the current rate, the population will reach 9.8 billion by 2050 and 11.2 billion by 2100. That's according to the United Nations Population Division. When it comes to 11 billion people, there's actually space for all of us. But the problem is not space, it's resources. Perhaps one of the biggest challenges the global population faces is a lack of fresh water. At the same time, there's only so much food that can be produced. Places like Africa are especially vulnerable to a lack of food and water, yet Africa is expected to see the sharpest increase in population in the world over the next 35 years. Where food is concerned, most scientists agree that the Earth can sustain any anywhere between 9 to 10 billion people. Some say that number could be stretched to 11 billion. But it isn't just food and water we need to worry about when it comes to a growing population. It's the emissions that the growing population produces. The Earth is already showing signs that there could be another global mass extinction on the way. Warming oceans created by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will kill off marine life that is vital for food supply. Rising oceans and extreme weather caused by a warmer planet will affect coastal cities, which are coincidentally some of the most populated. Changing precipitation patterns could cause decreased precipitation rates in some parts of Africa. No precipitation means no agriculture and very little human habitation. Scientists actually don't know if the world can sustain 11 billion people. If we do reach that number, we need to stabilize the growing population by reducing fertility rates. China invoked a one-child policy, and that brought down fertility rates significantly, while life expectancy is improving. There is evidence to suggest that fertility rates are already slowing down. In the 1960s, the fertility rate was 4.7 babies per woman. To 2.6 babies per woman between 2005 to 2010. One way of reducing fertility rates, according to Will Stiffen, an emeritus professor at the Fender School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University, is to raise the status of women. Make women more educated and give them employment, and they will undoubtedly have less children. This is especially true in poorer countries where women don't have the means or the knowledge on how to prevent pregnancies. If those women had the knowledge and access to contraception, less unwanted babies would be born. We know this because fertility rates in developed countries where women are educated have declined. Our Earth could very well support 11 billion people, and some experts say it could accommodate close to 100 billion. But then there's the question of how many of those people will be living in poverty, with not enough food to go around. 1 billion people on planet Earth are already living with nutrient deficiencies. It's difficult to say what percentage of 11 billion will be. But one thing's for certain, if we do not change our consumption habits and change them quickly, that could have catastrophic consequences. Developed societies need to move away from values like material Material wealth and switch to a model where societal well being is considered most important. We have to think about limiting the resources that we consume while still living comfortable lifestyles. One thing that I should also say is that the future will bring technological innovations that could help with the many problems associated with a growing population, like the XC4000, one of the largest buildings that could ever exist. The XC4000 could house up to 1 million people in comfort with minimal environmental impact. It's basically just a giant skyscraper that 1 million people live in. Cities of the future could consist of clusters of these large structures where 100 billion people could fit comfortably in an area the size of Germany. I should also say that the XC4000 was never meant to be built and would encounter considerable engineering problems. But who knows what ideas the future will bring. Perhaps there will be innovations in food production and cheaper ways to convert salt water into fresh water. That is why it is so difficult to determine how many people the earth could sustain. In the 1960s and 70s, scientists believed the global population population would be doomed in the next 20 years, and 50 years later, we're still here. Hey, what's that out in the distance? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Oh no, it's an alien planet on a crash collision course with Earth. And that spells only one thing, life on Earth is about to get really, really bad, and also really, really hot. Well, that goes without saying really, doesn't it? But if two great celestial bodies collided anywhere in the universe, the impact alone would be cataclysmic on a cosmic scale, and devastating to the solar system for eons to come. But what if it was our cute little pale blue dot? And um, what if I was to tell you it may have already happened before? Well. Hold on to your crash helmets because this ride's about to get a little bit bumpy. Hello internet, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the most inquisitive channel on YouTube, Live's Biggest Questions. As per usual, of your disembodied floating voice, Jack Finch, as today, we curiously ask the question, what if Earth smashed into another planet? Roll the clip.
For the curious amongst you, that clip was from the wholly depressing 2011 film Melancholia by Lars von Trier because, well, yeah, if Earth smashed into another planet, it would be pretty damn depressing for everyone and everything involved, right? Yeah. Exactly. It illustrates a pretty telling physical response though because cinema has done a relatively stand up job of depicting what our sky would look like with another planet looming above us and if it indeed was on a collision course primed to smash straight into us, all we could really do is grab our loved ones, hold them closely and hope that we get swallowed by some kind of deus ex machina portal to another dimension because it would be bad. Like, really, really bad. How do we know that? Well, because of a little thing called the giant impact hypothesis. Let me explain. Have you ever looked up at the moon and thought, hey, little guy, where did you come from? Well, back in 1898, a scientist named George Darwin, as in, yes, the son of our boy Charlie Darwin, hypothesized that the Earth and the Moon were once a single celestial body, and that a proto molten moon had been creatively spun out of the ejector from the Earth because of centrifugal forces. Well, he was definitely onto something, but it wasn't until 1975 when doctors William K. Hartman and Donald R. Davis proposed that the Moon was a result of our Earth colliding with a planet sized body, the collision of which caused the ejector to gradually coalesce and form the moon and they may have been bang on the money because the fact is that whole event would have taken a pretty massive celestial body probably something at least the size of Mars well in fact that hypothetical proto planet just so happens to have a title Theia named after the mythological Greek Titan who gave birth to the moon goddess Selene funny how those things work eh? well the components are already there so let's see precisely how they hypothetically played out we know that our earth was born around 4.5 billion years years ago, which although sounds like a long, long time, the fact is it isn't comparative to the age of our universe. During that time though, embryonic planets and proto worlds were a dime a dozen floating around, hitting into things, ready to find their own way in the universe. One of those was our special little planet, Earth, doing its thing, trying its best to keep a lid on all the bubbling soup of life below. And then along comes Theia, spinning and spinning and then boom, she hits us like a bat out of hell. And in that hypothesized instance, we can imagine exactly what life would be like on Earth today if another planet came hurtling at us from the deep void of space. Let's call that planet, oh, I don't know, something sinister like Ultron. If Ultron was roughly the same size as our planet, like Theia, and somehow fell out of the void of space toward Earth, by the time it was visible in the sky as in the same size as the sun or moon, we'd have roughly several weeks before it impacted us, based on the same scale as Earth's escape velocity, which is roughly 11 kilometers per second. In those several weeks, could we do anything to prevent our imminent extinction? Nah, pretty much nothing, actually, save the hope of somehow slapping together enough rockets to blast us all the way to Mars and continue the species. But hey, that sounds like a challenge worth taking, right? For the most part though, we'd have a few weeks to slowly witness our demise coming ever closer and closer. I mean, I wouldn't really want to paint the picture on what kind of globally depressing environment that would create, but imagine that you're sat at a really awkward dinner table, except everyone on earth is there and everyone's really, really sad. I mean, I imagine that some of us would light bonfires on the beaches, dancing around in a bright burst and a lust for life, shouting out into the cosmic void that, hey, we existed, if not for a short time, but hey, we were here, human beings. Beings. For the most part though, yeah, it would suck. Once the clock had finally run down though for a few split seconds before impact, we witnessed the planet Ultron up close and personal and it would terrifyingly fill our sky from one side of the horizon to the other. That is, if you're lucky enough to be on the side of the earth that witnessed the point of impact. Because a few nanoseconds before impact, both planets collective atmospheres would glow brightly as they were suddenly cataclysmically compressed. In those last few moments you'd be atomically vaporized by the heat and light released from the impact and you definitely wouldn't be smushed to death by some alien rock face. However, if you were on the other side of the planet, you'd have very little warning about how messed up things are about to get for you. Suddenly, you'd have to deal with the ground beneath you turning into an unpredictable trampoline made of rock and molten magma with the motivation of slinging you off into the atmosphere. If you didn't realize, that's a very bad thing also due to the fact that you, well, you can't breathe in space and you'd have nowhere left to go. All of that smashed up Earth would need to go somewhere though and due to a little scientific function known as a Roche limit, the resulting ejector as well as its atmosphere would be loosely kept inside the Earth's gravitational field but would also be kept inside Ultron's new gravity and for a moment the world's gravity would suddenly be pointing sideways. That means, yeah, you know that new treehouse you just built? See you later. 
what a waste of time. But all jokes aside, all life on Earth would end. Because we have to point back to the giant impact hypothesis where our moon was created from a devastating collision with the protoplanet Theia. In all likelihood though, if we added Ultron to the equation, we'd more than likely end up with another moon or maybe even several from the massively ejected ejecta. So hey, that's pretty cool right? Although we wouldn't be around to see it. <sighs> What a bummer. Well, I'm a little bit perturbed, guys, so there we have it, our bittersweet answer to what if Earth smashed into another planet. The sky is a beautiful vista, often full of majesty in the bright tapestry of the glory of our universe. We look up and the constant constellations remind us of our place, not only in our solar system, but also as a reminder of just how damn lucky we are that planet Earth hit the sweet spot when the infinite will of the cosmos decided on where to park us. We find comfort in its cosmic consistency, the sun, the stars and our moon. But uh, what if one day you looked up and instead of just one moon there were 79 and counting and all of them are uniquely hostile in their own perfect little way and that means only one thing. Yeah, let me explain. Hello internet, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the most inquisitive channel on YouTube, life's biggest questions. As per usual, I'll be your disembodied floating voice, Jack Finch, as today we curiously ask the question, what if Earth was a moon of Jupiter? amongst you, that clip was from sci-fi's incredible science fiction epic, The Expanse, based upon the equally awesome series of novels by Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, which is possibly one of the best space-themed television shows to grace our screens in the past few decades. It segues us to an important opening point as well, because if Earth was a moon of Jupiter, we better well hope that we've already discovered something similar to the Epstein Drive, the spaceship propulsion system featured in The Expanse that lets humanity travel freely across the solar system in efficiently propelled spaceships, because without it, we're pretty much sitting ducks when it comes to the terrifying intricacies of our new Jupiter lunar neighbours. Before we approach this question though, it's probably best that we lay out some of the frightening cosmic fancies of that strange giant planet known only as Jupiter. If you haven't yet seen our video detailing exactly what would happen if you plummeted through the gaseous landscape of Jupiter, then now would probably be high time to check it out. If for no other reason then Jupiter is interesting as hell and it's a pretty fun concept to imagine hurtling through its many deadly atmospheres in a spacesuit, right? Yeah, I'm glad we're on the same page. Jupiter is absolutely massive. It's the largest planet in our solar system and has a mass that is two and a half times greater than all of the other neighboring planets combined, excluding the sun of course, because that would just be ridiculous. In fact, Jupiter is so big that it could contain over 1300 Earths within its mass. Just let that sink in. It's also a gas giant, meaning that many of its planetary properties are colossally different than that of Earth's, warranting to the fact that because of its absolutely massive size, Jupiter's got a lot of love and a whole lot of gravity to affect the solar system with. Enter the 79 and counting moons of the Jovian system, all of them seeking shelter in Jupiter's all-consuming gravity, finding their home in the many layers of the rings of Jupiter. This is where things get interesting, and this is also where Earth would find its home in this particular hypothetical situation. The inner moons of Jupiter are tiny things, less than 200 kilometers in diameter, and are thought to have formed alongside Jupiter way back when in the cosmic soup. These are Metis, Adrastia, Amalthea, and Thebe. Say hello because they're our new neighbors. Alongside these are what is known as the Galilean moons that comprise some of the largest moons in the solar system, some of which are larger than several planetary bodies. These are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, first discovered by Galileo Galilei sometime in 1610. Familiarize yourself out with these guys because if Earth was a moon of Jupiter and ended up anywhere other than a similar orbit to these lunar entities, as in Jupiter's outer dust rings, then our planet would be torn apart by cataclysmic tidal forces and scattered to the cosmic winds. And of course, we don't want that. So let's say that our Earth finds itself in the same orbit as Europa, a small moon made up of silicate rock with some incredibly interesting mechanics. In the same orbital distance, our days would last around 85 hours, with up to 15 of those hours caught in the shadow of Jupiter in a weird kind of day-night, day, -night, day daily pattern. Also, by that principle alone, Earth just got super cold. And also, in all likelihood, our planet would become tidally locked to Jupiter thanks to its massive gravity, in a way similar to how our moon interacts with our planet. Being tidally locked would result in a very strange scenario, where one half of the planet dries out into an arid desert wasteland, and the other half 
turns into a frigid frozen ice cap of constant arctic winds and snow. This isn't too great of a position to be in, but it's not all doom and gloom because our species could actually survive this and in areas near the middle of this newly founded geothermal landscape, humanity could find a pretty comfortable home. However, it's not all tippity top because Jupiter's a pretty dangerous dude and this whole time he'd be spewing deadly amounts of radiation in our direction. Ah. That's not good. But also, don't worry, because we are in fact the lucky wielders of the shield that guards the realms of mankind, our magnetosphere, and in this hypothetical situation, that same shield that protects us from the sun's radiation would be fit for the task to protect us from Jupiter's as well. Thank you, Earth. We love you. But Jupiter's not done with us just yet, and this particular boss battle just segued into phase two. Because of its massive gravity, Jupiter has a strange effect on its many moons, and in essence, it heats them to a point where its celestial influence almost needs them like a ball of dough. Because of this strange influence, our Earth would become a hell of a lot more volcanic than it is now, and pretty much every volcano across the planet would be spewing out a constant stream of carbon dioxide into the air. Under any other circumstances, that would be known as a very terrible thing, but given the fact that in this situation our planet is tidally locked to Jupiter and half of it is frozen in darkness and ice, we would actually welcome a bit of global warming. I guess we just have to adapt to all of the clouds of sulphur and torrential downpours of acid rain. Hopefully. In actual fact, whilst it's easy to imagine Earth being a moon of Jupiter resulting in the end of our species, we could actually survive the whole ordeal given a bit of grit and determination, albeit with a much smaller population, down to the fact that we've got to deal with a couple dozen environmental disasters throughout the process. And if we did, we've got a whole host of cosmic phenomena to look forward to. The main one being, well, Jupiter in the sky constantly over 40 times the size of the moon. And we wouldn't just see Jupiter, but all of our other new neighboring moons, Io, Callisto, Ganymede, as well as all of the many smaller moons, perpetually dancing in the atmosphere alongside a beautiful cascade of lightning and a permanent aurora from the Jovian system. And if we did manage to survive the whole process and then also advance to some type of space flight, such as the one that we mentioned earlier, then we've got a whole new backyard ripe for the picking and the harvesting of some insanely rare and valuable metals, ores, and chemical compounds. In fact, with our proximity to Jupiter and our new tidally locked relationship, we'd have a fixed point perfect for shuttle launches and general space flights, so there'd be even more reason to invest in the exploration of our 79 new moon neighbours, as well as the rest of the solar system. So, how about it then guys? What do you say? Who's up for moving to Jupiter? Humans, as far as we know, live on the surface of the Earth with the rest of Earth's creatures. But there are actually conspiracy theories that exist that make the claim that our Earth is hollow and that actual humans live inside it. These conspiracy theories haven't been proven, but one has to wonder if there's something to them. Today, life's biggest questions asks, what if humans lived inside the Earth? Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions, the channel that asks the fundamental questions of life. The idea of the Earth being hollow is actually not new. It's called the Hollow Earth Theory, and it was first suggested by Edmund Halley, as in the guy that discovered Halley's Comet in the late 17th century. He suggested that the Earth consisted of several concentric shells that were separated by individual atmospheres. He believed the shell that was on the outside was around 500 miles thick. But the idea of the Earth being hollow and habitable actually goes back to ancient times. The concept of a subterranean land that existed inside the Earth is evident in mythology across many cultures. The Greeks called it the underworld. In Jude Judaism, it's Sheol, Buddhists called it Shambhala, and Christians called it Hell. But the question today is not what if Hell was real, though that's a great idea for a future episode of Life's Biggest Questions. The question today is what if humans lived inside the Earth? And guess what? We're not the first to ask that question. There's even a theory out there that there's a mythical civilization called Argatha that exists deep inside our planet. And you can thank Admiral Richard E. Byrd of the US Navy for that. Admiral Byrd is known for a record setting flight over the North Pole. According to one of his alleged diary entries from his polar flight, dated February 1947, Byrd came across a warm, lush climate with mammoth like creatures and an ancient human race that had been living inside the Earth. His diary entry goes on to say that these people used a saucer shaped aircraft to common deer his plane in midair, forcing him to land. Once Bird was on the ground, he was met by representatives whom some believe were part of the mythical Argatha civilization. These 
representatives told Admiral Byrd that they were concerned about the atomic bombs that were used during World War II. They sent him back to the US to relay their message to the government. Unfortunately, I know you're totally captivated by this story, but I'm about to burst your bubble. Most believe that this diary entry was fabricated. Admiral Byrd achieved his flight over the North Pole 20 years earlier than the dated diary entry, on May 7, 1926. It's also believed that Byrd didn't actually make it to the North Pole at all, and created fraudulent navigation records for his flight, taking the numbers from a different team who had reached the North Pole a few days earlier. Definitely a cool story though, you got to admit, but it's not the only semi-modern reference to Argatha. There's a theory out there that Hitler actually escaped persecution and went to the center of the earth. The Nazis were obsessed with esotericism and the occult, and there are Nazi maps in existence that appear to be instructions on how to reach Argatha. There's quite a lot of evidence actually that the Nazis tried to reach Argatha in case Hitler needed a last resort for escape. None of this has been proven, but you uh, got to admit. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? If humans lived inside the Earth, it would mean that we know nothing about our planet. We would have to reevaluate everything we know about the Earth and how other planets are made up and created. That would definitely be a hard thing for the science world to grasp. If humans lived inside the Earth, they might have a completely different way of communicating than humans that live on the surface. They could have other technologies as well. If humans lived inside the Earth, what would they even look like? They might have evolved in a different way than us. The biggest difference between living on the surface of the Earth and living inside of it is is the lack of the sun. UVA and UVB rays are essential for plants. Seeing as there's no sun inside the earth, maybe these humans would be very pale with a vitamin D deficiency. Depending on how advanced they were, these mole people, let's call them, could use LED lamps to grow crops for food. Or maybe those humans have evolved to not require vitamin D as we do. Maybe the humans that live inside the earth are extremely primitive, somewhat looking like Neanderthals. But humans can survive underground. According to a 2012 report by Slate, a Russian cult survived underground thanks to a vitamin D rich diet. As long as these humans were regularly consuming things like egg yolks, fish, milk and cheese, they were able to survive. So is there any possibility that humans live inside the earth? The deepest known drilling, the Kola Superdeep Borehole in Russia, reached 12,262 meters. That's around 12.2 kilometers. That's still way under what Edmund Haley proposed. He said that the outermost shell was 500 miles thick. The earth is comprised of layers, but they aren't shells like Haley said. Underneath the surface of the earth, it gets quite hot. When you drill through the crust, you get to the mantle. It's 1800 miles thick and its temperatures reach 1000 degrees Celsius. Humans don't live inside the earth. Our earth is very much a piece of rock with a liquid hot core. The best proof that the earth has a liquid hot core is actually our magnetic field, generated by the core. If our earth was hollow, it wouldn't have a magnetic field. Sun, sun, sun. Fun, fun, fun. Right now the Earth is at the perfect distance to enjoy the life-giving benefits of our sun. Things aren't too hot, things aren't too cold, they're just right. But what if the sun lurched forward a bit and got closer to planet Earth? What would happen then? What if the sun moved closer to Earth? Sizzle, sizzle, fry, fry, everybody die. Dies. Before we get into this video, I want to ask you guys why you think we have never given the sun a name. I guess we did name it Sun until we started calling other stars suns, and then it seemed kind of insignificant. All of the other planets in our solar system have a name, and I think our sun should have one too. I'd call it Shale. I don't know why, it just came to me. This is the universal symbol that scientists have come up with to denote the sun a circle with a dot in it. So while the sun doesn't have a name, it does have a symbol. Pretty cool, right? So, the sun. Right now, we are living in an astrobiological habitable zone, the circumstellar habitable zone. We sometimes just call it the Goldilocks zone, as it is just right for housing life as we know it. Anyway, the conservative habitable zone falls within the optimistic habitable zone. Planet Earth almost is perfectly in the middle, but there is one planet that is the most habitable, seemingly. Gilly 667cc falls right bang in the middle. The exoplanet is 23 light years away from us in the constellation of Scorpius and could be a good option for future colonization. Habitable zones are places where surface liquid water is likely to be discovered, which is a key element in life. Again, as we know it. The thing is about a habitable zone is a concept which has very much been created with our needs in mind. It's habitable for us. Humans need water, light, oxygen, but we have evolved in response to the conditions of our planet. Because of the way Earth orbits the sun, it's never the same distance away day to day. At its farthest, the sun is 152,095,701 kilometers away for us. At its closest, the sun is just 
147,098,074 kilometers away. A small difference in the sun's distance, and when I say small, I just mean a few million kilometers. It's all good. But if the sun was significantly closer, well, that would be a problem. Our neighboring planet Venus, the second rock from the sun, is just 108 million kilometers away from the sun, and it's else. Corchio there. The mean surface temperatures are around 462 degrees Celsius or 863 degrees Fahrenheit. The factors aren't the same as Earth, but nonetheless, Nout can survive upon Venus's blistering surfaces, including water. If there was any anyway, it would have evaporated long ago. The thing is, while the Sun does move, it orbits the center of the Milky Way, taking us with it as it goes. It isn't in the business for lurching forward closer to us, that just isn't how it works. We are locked into a gravitational orbit with the sun. And now unless there was something super massive that came along and gave us all the sun a good shove, that orbit will remain steady. If the sun gained mass, then Earth would be drawn closer to it. But being a burning hot ball, the sun is constantly shifting mass to energy. It can't gain more. Although just to make things a little bit more complex, it seems that the more the sun converts its mass into energy, the bigger it gets. Let me explain. The sun fuses hydrogen into helium, making it burn baby burn. It seems that the sun loses mass at the rate of 4 million tons a second, which sounds like a lot, but comparatively to the size of the sun, this is pretty negligible. So while this doesn't affect our orbit, this does mean the sun is getting hotter. And as it gets older and bigger in terms of flame size, things could be a bit of a problem. In that respect, the sun will move closer to us. The sun is currently around 4.5 billion years old, and in around 5 billion years, it's going to reach its end of life phase. Before that, in 1.1 billion years, the sun will have expanded by 10%, making its rays hotter and brighter to Earth. In 3.5 billion years, the sun will be 40% brighter than it is now. This is danger time for the planet. 10% we might be able to deal with. Perhaps by that point, human development could create giant reflectors to send some light back into space to stop the sun heating up our surface temperatures. Even then, this will likely be enough to melt what may be left of our polar ice caps, which would mean huge floods to coastal areas, whereas hotter temperatures across the globe will increase droughts in landlocked areas. If the sun got much brighter than that, and the flames got closer, well, our Earth would be irreparably scorched. First, the lakes will boil and evaporate, and then the ocean. We would likely be long dead by then, but if we weren't, kissing goodbye to our water would be a final nail in the coffin. When the sun reaches the later part of its life, the red giant phase, it will expand very close to Earth indeed. It is calculated that the sun will swell so large that it will consume Mercury and Venus, and it is quite likely that Earth will be sucked in too. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Dilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. Our distance to the sun determines our seasons, ocean currents, climates, and radiation on Earth. If we were to shake up that key factor, well, it would very much upset the force. A closer sun in simple terms means that we would be knocked out of the habitable zone, which again, in simple terms, means death for all. Maybe by the time the sun does expand and its flames get closer to Earth, humans will likely have moved to a new habitable zone. Maybe. Maybe by this time, Mars will be looking pretty cushy. Or if we found a way to travel the speed of light or faster, or maybe we could haul ass to another star. Sorry, son. Thanks for all the memories. Good job we never gave you a name so we couldn't get too attached, right? For thousands upon thousands of years, throughout the tall tales of human history, the final hours of our species have long been lamented upon. Will we disappear in a blaze of cosmic hellfire? Will we shuffle from this mortal coil after the choking devastation of a nuclear winter? Or will our life-giving sun decide to spit forth an earth-scorching solar flare and snuff out this brief candle that we once called humanity? Whichever form the apocalypse would take, it need not matter though, because what we're concerned with is how our planet Earth would fare after our species suddenly disappeared. So, I guess we better find out. What would happen to Earth after humans disappear? Roll the clip. We're the hollow men. We're the stuffed men. Leaning together. Headpiece filled with straw. For the curious amongst you, that particularly moody and atmospheric scene was of course of Marlon Brando's relentlessly brilliant performance in Francis Ford Coppola's legendary cinematic work Apocalypse Now, which is quite fitting really. And of course, Colonel Kurtz himself just so happened to be reading the equally apocalyptic poem The Hollow Men, written by T.S. Eliot in 1925. That particular poem ends with the final lines, This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Which 
can only mean one thing. Ah, it's the end of the world as we know it, but unfortunately we don't feel fine in this given hypothetical situation because as you may have already been mentally alarmed by the title of this particular life's biggest question, the end of civilization has sadly already occurred. However, now that we're on the subject of artists throughout the ages that have mused upon the end of humanity, we can begin our question in parentheses by addressing another contemporary comic, the legendary George Carlin, who when it comes to the end of the world has an incredibly important bit to share. Planet isn't going anywhere. We are. Exactly, George. Thank you. And in that particular stand up show, Mr. Carlin outlined the fact that our fair planet Earth has been around for a little over four and a half billion years, during which time our pale blue dot has been through so many cataclysmic catastrophes that it's earned itself quite a few stripes in the process. Solar flares, volcanoes, worldwide floods, continental forest fires, cosmic rays, millennia long swathes of ice ages, gigantic asteroids, and that was before we even came along. At one point, our planet was literally a boiling soup of magma. It's safe to say that this wonderful place that we currently call our home is quite resilient. You see, the thing is, we're the ones that are fragile because unlike planet Earth, we can't recover and we've only been around for a fraction of a second compared to the vast ancestry of our planet. But as is the case in this hypothetical situation, we've tragically blown our only chance like a kid who left their homework till the last minute. But now that we're here, we may as well take a look around and see what the planet has in store now that humanity has disappeared. And the good news is that despite our towering monoliths of engineering and architecture, now that we are out of the equation, the planet would eventually become a much better place for the surviving species of the animal kingdom. Initially though, things would be a little sketchy, as those aforementioned infrastructures of industry would have a tendency to, well, kind of blow up. Within the first few days, our systems of infrastructure that require constant human control would inevitably meet their unsupervised end. Subways across the planet would begin filling with water as the regulatory plumbing systems that keep most of them below the water table free from flooding would break down and begin to fail. Within a week, most water cooling systems in nuclear reactors would run out of fuel, setting off a chain of explosive events that would become so catastrophic that if we were still alive, then it's good night Vienna all over again. Not only that, but all of those satellites currently orbiting the globe, yeah, they're going to be plummeting back down to terra firma within a few days, which will only add fuel to the fire given the fact that there are approximately 4,987 currently in orbit. Watch out because the sky is indeed falling, drop that ass for it crash. Not only that, but the risk of a petroleum fueled blaze of hellfire is incredibly likely. With all of the oil and gas reserves currently on our planet, all it would take is a single one of these highly likely explosive events to trigger a continental wildfire. Take a look at the Kuwaiti oil fires for example, where over 700 oil wells were set fire to during the Persian Gulf War that blazed relentlessly from January 1991 up until November the 6th, releasing so much smoke into the sky that it resulted in a 2% annual global emissions increase of carbon dioxide on our planet. Now imagine that on every continent. Yeah, not a pretty picture. In fact, with our demise and subsequent disappearance without the capability of maintaining these fragile systems of energy and power, we could very well do catastrophic damage to many, many of the surviving species. And that's even without addressing the fact that there's currently 300 million tons of plastic in our oceans and now there's no one around to clean it up. Yeah things are looking pretty bad. But here comes the hubris guys because as we said previously, Earth is a resilient planet and although the demise of our civilization may very well cause many further catastrophic fallouts, given a long enough time, planet Earth will begin to heal. Within several years, perhaps the most successful species will be our avian friends who, without the massive interference from electromagnetic and radio signals, would be free to populate unhindered, perhaps reaching gigantic flocks of up to 1 billion birds. Within five or so years, taking into account the apocalyptic devastation wrought across the planet, most buildings that weren't made from metal would likely already be crumbling, although it would take perhaps as long as 300 years for large metallic structures to begin falling down. So if any alien species did manage to pop in for a visit, at least they could find comfort in knowing that someone used to live here. 
there would still be clear apparent signs of our civilization for at least another thousand years without intervention. But at that point, who knows what type of wild and frenzied biosphere our planet Earth would have cooked up just to deal with the apocalyptic treasure trove that our species left behind. Eventually, there would be only a few specific landmarks remaining to flagpole our significance on this planet. The Channel Tunnel between England and France would likely still be there, it would just take you know, a bit of digging to find it. The same applies to Mount Rushmore, whose presidential likeness would look a tad weathered, but still evidence of our civilization nonetheless. Perhaps even the Great Pyramids of Giza would still be standing, given the fact that they have already withstood the endless sands of time, and may well serve as a reminder to the next sentient species on our planet that we, humanity, once existed. You see, George Carlin was right, eventually our planet will be fine. She'll need a little bit of healing and a tad recalibration, she'll probably have to endure a few more ice ages to get things back into ship shape, but planet Earth will continue to spin nonetheless. You see, it's humanity that can't withstand the end of the world. The world is an amazing place. In a universe so unfit for life, the Earth is a haven that allows life to flourish. But what exactly is it that makes our world so perfect for life, and why is that the case? Let's explore. If you want more science videos, check out our Biggest Science Questions playlist on the channel. Now get ready, it's time to ask the question, why is the Earth so perfect for life? When comparing our planet to others in the solar system and beyond, there are a number of ways in which the Earth, just like the baby bear's porridge, is just right. The Goldilocks analogy is a good one, and one that's often used to describe Earth's ability to sustain life. Venus is the daddy bear planet, with an atmosphere too heavy and hot to sustain life. Mars is the mama bear, with an atmosphere that's too thin and cold. Thankfully, the Earth is just right in a number of ways. For one, we have liquid water, something that is vital to life. Liquid water acts as a sort of lubricant for the molecular processes of life. As a universal solvent, liquid water plays a unique role in mediating the chemical reactions involved in life, so we're fortunate to have such plentiful water on the surface of the Earth. We also have an energy source, namely the sun which happens to be beautifully arranged for us as well. We're the right distance from the sun, which means that the planet has relatively mild temperatures that allow for liquid water on Earth. Not only are we the right distance from the sun, but the sun itself has been found to be more stable than many other stars, which helps to avoid surges that could be devastating to life on Earth. The composition of the Earth is helpful as well. The hot core and rocky mantle make Earth much better suited for supporting life than a gas giant like Jupiter. There are ample amounts of building blocks of life, such as carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and an atmosphere that can help to block out the sun's rays. The molten core of the Earth is incredibly important for life since it's instrumental in creating a strong magnetic field. This field protects the Earth from the radiation of the sun, which would otherwise be very harmful to any life found on the planet. Our moon also works in our favor, helping to stabilize the Earth's orbital axis. This helps the Earth to have a moderate tilt, once again hitting that Goldilocks spot. Without the moon, some scientists believe that the Earth's tilt could have a variance of up to 85 degrees, which would result in huge climate shifts and thus mass extinction. Finally, the solar system itself is arranged in a way that permits the creation of an Earth-like planet. Jupiter acts as the blocker to Earth's quarterback, shielding our planet from what would otherwise be a constant rain of asteroids and comets. It's estimated that we would experience roughly 10,000 times more asteroid and comet strikes if Jupiter wasn't there blocking for us. So thanks, Jupe. I call Jupiter Jupe. We're tight like that. Some believe that this lucky combination of factors is proof of a creator, since the odds of all these things occurring are so slim. However, there are a few issues with this. The incredible number of planets in the universe mean that there are bound to be some that happen to check all the right boxes. We didn't appear on Earth and then it happened to be perfect, we appeared on Earth because it was perfect. The conditions on Earth were such that early life could begin, and so it did, and eventually through evolution by natural selection, we appeared. So at the end of the day, the Earth is perfect for life, because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here to notice it. Doesn't matter how slim the odds were, the fact that life exists means that the unlikely did happen. When you throw infinity into the mix, even the most unlikely of events become much more likely to occur. And since we're here, it seems that we got lucky. Go us. Of course, I should point out that the Earth actually isn't perfect for life, and certainly not human life. It has many of the necessary variables, but there are certain things that would make it better. The world is not a perfect masterpiece for humans. It has disease and parasites that cause death by the millions. However, all in all, we're certainly better off on our imperfect but life-sustaining world than we would have been on Jupiter. And now we return to our question, why is the Earth so perfect for life? Well, technically it isn't perfect, but it does beat seemingly astronomical odds to possess a combination of factors that allowed life to thrive. With the right combination of elements, distance from the sun, atmosphere, and liquid water, the Earth has been the happy home of life for millions of years. Some claim that these slim odds prove that the Earth was intelligently created, but that doesn't take into account the vast number of planets that weren't so lucky. At the end of the day, regardless of how everything began, I for one am glad things worked out the 
the way they did, because life is pretty awesome. Thank you for watching Life's Biggest Questions. I hope this was interesting and informative, and maybe even inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you like this video, please thumbs up and subscribe to the channel down below. While you're down there, let me know one thing you would change about the world if you could. Until next time, I'm Ron McKenzie Lafergie with Life's Biggest Questions, wishing you the best of luck on your quest for answers.